So first of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm an associate professor here at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And the research that I'm going to be presenting is funded by the Faculty of Science and Technology and the Office of Research, Scholarship and Community Engagement at Mount Royal. This research would not have been possible if it wasn't for my amazing co-investigators and my students. First of all, I want to acknowledge my postdoctoral research mentor, Professor Lauren Cobb, who is uh, currently happily retired in, and settled in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, collaborators from Spain, the Barcelona Institute for Global Health, and also my student, undergraduate research assistant, Ms. Alisa Fries, who has done some tremendous work on geospatial maps. Without further ado, I'd like to get into the outline of my presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about five key topics, the gridded population of the world, the spatio-temporal compartmental model that I will use to track COVID-19 in Spain, the Bayesian data assimilation methods, particularly what is called as the optimal interpolation to track diseases as they spread in a geographical area in real time. And finally, I will present some concluding remarks. So I find that if I turn off my video, it works quite seamlessly and there is no lag. So I'm going to turn off my video right now. Okay, first I'm going to talk about the gridded population of the world. Gridded population of the world depicts the distribution of human population across the globe. The basic inputs for GPW are population data and administrative boundaries from world censuses. So what GPW provides is a spatially disaggregated population layer that is compatible with several disciplines. Throughout my presentation, you will see these hyperlinked text and you are encouraged to click on these links and it will directly take you to the resources. Just so you know, the gridded population of the world is entirely free to download. You have to go to the Center for International Earth Science Information Network website, which will be listed later on, and you can download the gridded population of the world. The GPW in version four has more input administrative units, more census variables, and improved spatial resolution from its previous version. By census variables, I mean you are able to now get the sex, age, urban rural designation for the entire world context. You are also able to get the demographic break breakdowns such as elderly population in urban areas or school aged children or women of childbearing age. So there are so many demographic breakdowns that you could incorporate into your models. So GPW gives you that flexibility. GPW can be downloaded as a population count or as population density. At the equator, population count and population density are the same. The farther you move away from the equator towards North Pole or South, you will experience that the population count and population density are different. Population count will be the true number of people living are inhabiting in that particular grid cell. So we are going to look at the entire world context as non-overlapping grid cells at several resolutions and for several target years. So this table lists the available resolutions. The GPW version four is, is being put out in the finest resolution of 30 arc second resolution, which roughly translate to a grid cell of one kilometer by one kilometer. So you have to realize at the equator, these grid cells are around one square kilometer. The further you go north or south, the cell sizes change according to the width of the longitudinal lines. Okay. So 30 arc second is the finest resolution available right now. If you want any finer, if you go to the world pop website, you even have a resolution of up to 100 meters by 100 meters. For this research, we had narrowed down between 2.5 and 15 minutes. And fortunately, these are raster layers. 
So you can use our package raster and you can aggregate to any spatial resolution of your uh, liking. You know, depending on how much your laptop can handle, you can aggregate to a corresponding resolution. Next up, I would like to talk about the format of the data. GPW4 is downloaded as a GeoTIFF file, georeferenced geo tag image file format. So it's at the end of the day, an image file, but not like PNG or JPEG where you double click and you see it. It has a lot of metadata. It is a compressed tag image file format. To give you an example, the 30 arc second resolution file is about 400 MB in its compressed form. In its uncompressed form, it's about three gigs, right? Now, you will also notice the finest resolution 30 arc second has a row count of 21,000 and a column count of 43,000. So when you multiply those two, the entire world context is expressed in close to a billion cells. So that's how fine we have population data available to us. In order to download, you follow these steps. You first go to the CSIN website, the Center for International Earth Science Information Network that is hosted in the Columbia University. In that CSIN, there are several departments. One of the departments is called as the CDAC, Socioeconomic Data and Applications Center. And then you narrow down to the GPW data version four, which is the latest version as of December, 2018. You pick your target year, and then you download whether uh, you want the population density or the population count. So I have given the website for you on the bottom if you'd like to try it out. I have chosen the 2020 population uh, data. Okay, so here are the key steps. First, you download the GPW version 4 GTIF image. Then you ask yourself, where do you want your, uh, your simulation to be run? So you typically crop out a desired region. It could be a state, province, an entire country, or even a continent. Or if you want to run a simulation on a global scale, you will use the entire world context. For me in this research, my desired region is Spain. And I use the raster package to crop out only the Spain area. Okay. After I crop out the region from the GeoTIFF file, I convert it to a network common data form called as NetCDF using the NCDF4 package. And finally, the NetCDF file is viewed using a visualization tool called Panoply. All of these listed here are free. And I'm also happy to share the R code if anybody is interested in knowing how to crop. In fact, if you click this link on the bottom here, it gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how you would go about downloading and cropping out a particular region of interest. Previously, I had mentioned what NetCDF is. It's a network common data form. This is probably an industry standard in weather forecasting, oceanography, and meteorology. Uh, this file format is known for array-oriented scientific data, and the project is hosted in Boulder, Colorado by the UCAR folks, the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. I also mentioned something called Panoply. This is a free visualization tool. Uh, if you click this hyperlink, you can go and download this for Mac, Windows, uh, Linux, etc. It's completely open source and uh, free. Panoply offers a wide variety of map projections. It, they have dozens of projections and also color palettes to choose from. So here is an example. Oh, actually, before going to an example, my motivation in this research is to capture the full spatiotemporal dynamics of COVID because it has received a lot of attention and due to its highly nonlinear outbreak dynamics. So what we try to do in this research is to study the full spatial dynamics of COVID-19 as it spreads across a two-dimensional physical space, not just across a small network of connected cities. So this is not a network model, or this is, a, I mean, this is a fully spatial model. So in this research, we, speak, we seek primarily to clarify mathematical ideas rather than to offer definitive medical answers. So my spatial domain will be the country of Spain. Spain is consisted of 17 critical, uh, sorry, uh, autonomous communities, okay? 
So you will have to include the Canary Islands. And there is a small city in North Africa called Siveta and Melilla. So these are also part of uh, Spain. So 17 autonomous communities and two autonomous cities. For our research, we were playing around with the resolutions 2.5 minutes and the 15 arc minute resolution. When I crop out the region for Spain, I ended up getting a grid of 195 rows and 342 columns at the 2.5 arc minute resolution. And I was getting 33 rows, 57 columns at the 15 arc minute resolution. So we used the raster aggregate function and applied for a five arc minute resolutions. And that's what I will use in today's presentation. So my resulting spatial domain has 98 rows, 171 columns, which roughly translates to 16,758 non-overlapping grid cells. So my simulation is run at five arc minute. Five arc minute roughly translates to a grid cell, which is uh, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. Now, this is how my spatial domain would look like using panoply. So when I crop out all of Spain, obviously I'm going to have to include parts of North Africa, France, Portugal, Gibraltar, Andorra, Algeria, Morocco, and so on, right? This is the UN adjusted population count for the year 2020 at the five arc minute resolution. So you see that presented in absolute scale as well as logarithmic scale. Now, one thing you need to realize in Panoply, there is an option which is turned on by default. That option is called interpolation. If you turn it off, you can clearly see the pixelated data or patchy data. So this is how the data is really presented in, uh, in terms of pixels or grid cells. But if you turn the interpolation on, it will look smooth. In reality, it's a pixelated data as you, as you see over here. So I'm just trying to show that it's quite easy to grab the population data for other countries using the same R code that I'm willing to share. You just have to change the bounding box for other countries. For example, Colombia, England and Wales, West Africa, Nigeria, China and Brazil are coming up in the next slides. So here is uh, at the 2.5 arc minute resolution for Colombia for the year 2015. And if I use an aggregation factor of 10 by 10, it will look like this. So this has about 2 million cells. This has about 20,000 cells. Okay, and this is uh, the gridded population of the world for England and Wales. I use this for my uh, measles simulation. On the bottom, you will see something called as a color palette. I like to use something called as Simmons Haxby CPT but there are dozens of color palettes one could choose from. This is West Africa, when we were running some simulations for Ebola outbreak. This is Nigeria, which is another ongoing project to track the spread of COVID in Nigeria. Now coming back to, uh, this is again China, Brazil in absolute and raw scale. The GPW files can also be used or can be opened using open source tools called as QGIS. So here are my three students, Brittany, Alyssa, and uh, uh, Jocelyn, who had worked on importing the GPW files using QGIS, and they have presented this to me at various spatial resolutions. So Panoply is not the only tool out there. There are other tools for visualizing, visualizing GPW data. Now coming, to, coming back to Spain. So the spatial distribution of susceptibles is presented to you here in the form of 98 rows and 171 columns. You will notice that Portugal, France, and North Africa are all white. The, the reason for that is um, as strange as it's going to sound, I have made those countries uninhabitable. I'm going to focus my primary attention of the disease spread only in Spain. So for every country, there is something called as ISO numeric. Okay, for example, France has ISO numeric of 250. Uh, Spain has ISO numeric of 724 and so on and so forth. So in our program, I say any country that is not 724, just make it zero and make it uninhabitable. So my model 
has one of the boundary conditions that, that there is no migration, there is no immigration, uh, there's no emigration and there is no in-migration also. As if people don't pack up and leave to other towns. Okay, so people in Spain, the 46 million people remain in Spain and for the entire duration of the epidemic. So the first compartment is my susceptible compartment. Uh, this is called as a virgin population. A disease has not been introduced to this population yet. So therefore, everybody in the population is susceptible. And I gradually start adding compartments. My model will be called as the SEIRD model. People are used to standard SIR type models where there are no grid cells. In fact, that's the frame of mind they come in. But when you look at this flow chart, you'll have to realize that this, these five epidemic states or compartments applies one of these for each of those 16,758 grid cells. So there are five compartments within each grid cell. Okay, And the disease is going to move from one cell to another. All right. Now, transition of individuals from previous to the next stage of the disease are seen as stochastic movements between the corresponding compartments. So in order for people to move from one compartment to another, you need these raster layers. You could stack it up on the top or on the bottom. How, it doesn't matter how you stack it, but you create these raster layers and these raster layers are filled with zeros. So exposed, infectious, recovered and dead are all initially zero. The susceptible population is what you have from the gridded population of the world. So each 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer cell has the following states. And I see a couple of chat messages. I, I hope it's all right to switch. Okay, I'm gonna continue my presentation. Right, so here is a schematic diagram of my SEIRD model. So remember, this is applied or replicated on each of the grid cells. Within each time step, Time step is really arbitrary. It could be one day, one week, a bi week. But for whatever your time step is, within each time step and within each grid cell, a part of the population flows along the arrows of this diagram, driven by the parameters beta, gamma, sigma, and delta. Now, there are two dashed boxes the S, E, and I are in one box, and R and D are in one box. That's because S, E, and I are called as transient states. And uh, R and D are called absorbing states. Once people enter these compartments, they remain in this compartment for the duration of the epidemic. Whereas people can move from susceptible to exposed to infectious. And then they can also exit the inf infectious compartment, but no, not all of them at the same time. It, it's, it's a fraction of people moving from one compartment to another in a given time step. Okay. Now, we don't have a vaccine for COVID-19 just yet, but how if somebody is wondering how my model would change uh, once a vaccination is available and people are uh, taking the vaccination, it would be reflected by adding another absorbing state called vaccination, and my model could be expanded as an SVIRD model, SVEIRD model. Okay. Now, let me get to the mathematics portion of it. I'm going to introduce the spatiotemporal model. Okay, so here is the model. There is one equation per, com uh, per compartment or per epidemic state. In continuous time, the epidemic dynamics are defined by a system of what are called as integral differential equations for the state variables. The IDEs, IDE as an in integral differential equations, capture both change over time and change over space. So this is where, uh, we differ from the traditional ODEs. These are called as IDEs because they capture change over time and change over space. We also make the natural assumption that the equations are numerically stable and convergent. Now, this is a simple enough model in principle, though it is quite computationally intensive. If anybody interested in the references, I'm happy to share outside of this presentation. Uh, the popular references are obviously the Bailey's book, the Hopenstadt book, and so on. I can also talk to anyone interested outside of this webinar and send you some references on uh, the spatiotemporal models. 
one thing you have to notice in these IDEs is that the sum of all flows between states should be zero. Because in this case, we don't allow for vital dynamics. There are no births. There are no in-migrations also. So every term in these IDEs cancel out and there is an equilibrium maintained. Okay. At the heart of this model is the weight function, the WXYUV. Now, as the first law of geography goes, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Okay, the function W here weights the rate of exposure by the distance between infectious people and susceptible hosts. So you have to realize when susceptible hosts come in contact with infectious individuals, they are exposed. So there is this uh, incubation period where when susceptible hosts come in contact with the infectious individuals, they become exposed, they remain in the exposed compartment for a certain duration, and then they move on to the infectious compartment. One thing we could never predict is the human movement. Human movement patterns play a central role in the spread of infectious diseases, but it's a very hard problem to predict the human movement. We try our best in this research using a specific exponential decay weight function, but there are other uh, exponent, uh, there are other weight functions one could incorporate. I will show uh, a few for example. Now here is uh, what is called as a Google mobility report. You can download the Google mobility reports for any country from this website over here. They put this out every few weeks. So if you look at Spain for April 2020, compared to the baseline, there were significant drop in recreation, grocery and pharmacy shopping, people getting out to parks, transit and so on and so forth. There have been a significant drop in all of April, right? So there was very limited movement of people. Whereas when it comes to the month of May in my next slide, you will see things are starting to come back to normal. It's not as controlled as before. In April, there were significant drops in retail and recreation uh, for human movement. Once again, human movement patterns play a central role in the spread of infectious diseases. So when you cut down all the road, rail, and air, net, uh, air travel, it's going to have a significant impact on human movement. Personally for me, if you look at this slide here, I have opted in for something called as uh, geolocation history. So every month Google sends me an email saying the places where I had visited. Now April was perhaps one of the important months for me. I never left the house. My family and I just boarded up ourselves and we, uh, you can see there are five red dots here. Uh, four of them are grocery stores and one is my house. So you can imagine I hadn't left the house at all, pretty much. So, so many of these days I remained at home, except to step out to buy milk and bread. But things got really out of uh, control. You know, we cannot be indoors for a long time. So we took a small uh, trip down 200 kilometers down south to a falls. Uh, and then, you know, followed all the social distancing guidelines, wear our mask, gloves, and so on. We came back. So again, this is month of May compared to month of April where you know, people don't get out much, but things are starting to get relaxed. Um, so that's what I'm trying to capture that the human movement patterns is hard to predict. When it comes to Spain, you have these major road networks, you have these major train uh, routes, the long distance routes versus high speed routes. You also have major airports. So one would want to incorporate movement of people from one place to another via several modes of transportation. Okay. What we had included is a dispersal gradient or a dispersal function for COVID-19 that spread through close proximity or contact between hosts to pro proliferate the disease as a traveling wave. So we have used this uh, first option a dispersal function, which has an exponential decay. But there are other uh, possible dispersal kernels out there. There are fat-tailed or leptocurtic kernels. There are power law kernels with distance. There is the Gaussian kernel and so on. But pretty much all of them assume the following, that the kernels are radially symmetric and they decrease 
as a function of the distance. If anybody is interested in the dispersal kernels, I'm happy to say, spend, uh, send you some references. But I would actually uh, recommend that you look up something called plant disease epidemics. These folks have done a lot of work on dispersal kernels, plant disease epidemiology. And once again, I'm happy to send you some references. So the particular dispersal function, I'm gonna look at my, the time. So the particular dispersal kernel we use uh, has an exponential decay given by W, X, Y, U, V on the bottom here. And we use this to calculate the number of people who are going to be newly exposed after one time step. So the number of people who are newly exposed in this grid cell is a random Poisson of the rate of exposure, the number of susceptible people in that grid cell, the number of people living in that cell. So remember that N of T is for not the entire population of Spain. It's scaled by the number of people living in that particular cell. But what's most important is that it's not simply the number of infectious in that cell alone, but it's a weighted sum of infectious in a given neighborhood. Okay. So with my Spanish colleagues, last week uh, I was annotating this slide quite a bit and we came up with the following and we asked ourselves, on average, how much kilometers would an individual travel for work or for other, other travel reasons, and then come back to their house. So if this cell is their home cell, every single time step, they get out of this cell, or may, they may remain in this cell, but there is a maximum distance they travel and come back. So we were uh, debating some values on 10 kilometers, 30 and 20 and so on. That determines the radius of our neighborhood. Okay. So at the end of the day, it's a random Poisson, beta times s of t times i tilde of t divided by n of t. And I have clarified what n of t is. n of t is the sum of all people living in that cell. It could include people who are susceptible, who are exposed, who are infectious, and who are recovered. Not the dead, of course, right? So, and the uh, time step here is one day. So this is how we, um, you know, if you look at the Moore neighborhood, for example, if the radius was one, then we find the weighted sum of the infected in the current cell as well as the neighboring cells, call that as nearby infected, and we feed it to this random Poisson, which is having uh, a parameter given by intensity times the proportion of susceptible times the nearby infected. Intensity is nothing but the mixing rate multiplied by the rate of exposure. So we had assumed homogeneous mixing, so the mixing rate will be a one. And this is the weight function that I have already addressed. Okay, so, sorry. In terms of an ordinary differential equation, still continuous, but it, when applied to each grid cell, we define an operator acting on all compartments to account for the, all the transitions in and out of the compartment in a given time interval dt. So we therefore use a discrete time approximation to the underlying continuous time model in the stochastic formulation. The stochasticity is quite limited in our model. The only place we introduce stochasticity is here. Random Poisson. And the same, same quantity is um, removed from the susceptible compartment, but added to the exposed compartment. How you code it in a computer as a pseudocode? Well, you have what is called as adjacency matrix. You know, the next susceptible is the previous susceptible minus new exposed and so on and so forth. So there is an equilibrium maintained here. You can cancel out the terms. Okay, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the initial conditions. So we introduce infections in a virgin population. So we're going to introduce a few people who are exposed, infectious, recovered and dead. Although I don't have to necessarily introduce any recovered and dead because those are absorbing states. The primary focus will be on seeding some exposed and infectious individuals in this virgin population. The current situation is that there are about 57,000 active cases 
and the most affected communities or autonomous communities are in Madrid and uh, the Catalonia region. Those are the most affected. As you can see, the index case appeared in February and these are the daily incidents. There was a peak around March and then it has gradually started to drop off. There's no telling um, when and how it will shoot back up. And this is with respect to deaths. There were a lot of deaths in April, uh, March and April, but uh, the curve has considerably been flattened. So this is the aggregated daily COVID incidents and deaths in Spain from February through June 6th. And this is the per capita map for the 17 autonomous communities and uh, the two North African cities. So you'll notice um, Madrid and uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is the Castilla La Mancha autonomous community. Those two are uh, quite high, more than 831 confirmed cases per 100,000. Okay, so I'm going to show you the first simulation run. In this simulation, I run from May through October for, for a six month period. Okay, and in the following demonstration, the model parameters were set in advance based on the characteristics of COVID-19 and the extent of social distancing. Really, the beta parameter is what plays a crucial role. If beta is small, social distancing is fully followed. If beta is high, social distancing has been released. Okay, so this is how I seed my simulation. I introduced a few infections, uh, not few, actually quite a few, um, close to 60,000 new infections in these 17 communities. And uh, twice as many people have been exposed into these 17 communities. Okay, and this is the uh, active cases map, the prevalence map. Okay, I'm gonna play the simulation. So notice how the Madrid, the Catalonia, Sevilla regions are showing. Um, these are after all uh, prevalence maps, just so you know. Okay. So I run this for 100, 180 days. Now I had turned off the interpolation. If I had turned on the interpolation, all of these will be much more smoother, but I have turned off the interpolation. That's why you see a lot of pixelated. Um, okay. Now here is a schematic of an improved model. Like we do have observational data. The government and the public health officials in Spain are collecting and are reporting good quality data. So all said and done, we may move from a standard SEIRD model to a slightly improved model where we have compartments for hospitalized, recovered, um, infectious, asymptomatic, and possibly ICU also as a compartment. So we do have observational data available for incidents, prevalence, hospitalized, recovered, and dead. In data assimilation, one would want to incorporate this data and present an improved belief on where the disease is. So that's what is my second part of my research. Okay. So here are some links for the official data. If one were to be interested, I have provided some GitHub link. I also have another link called data sources for other countries. I'm maintaining a, a Google Doc where I have several links for other countries if you're interested you could check it out uh, one thing that came about yesterday from a statement from world health organization is that according to them it seems to be rare that asymptomatic person actually transmits onward to a secondary individual that's actually a great news i mean according to them it's very rare that an asymptomatic person would transmit the disease so this is just heart of the press release yesterday and that's a great news Moving on to Bayesian data assimilation, I believe I have just a few minutes left, but I will show you uh, what we did with Bayesian data assimilation for a more matured uh, model. 
So a, a more matured modeling effort was done for measles in pre-vaccine England and Wales. And I'm going to show that to you right now. The central question is, how can we achieve optimal Bayesian tracking of infectious diseases in both space and time, not just with connected network of cities, given that the data is presented to you in an irregular fashion, and the data is highly aggregated, and the data has a lot of uncertainties or missing values. So when you're dealing with data with these issues, how can you optimally track the spatial spread of a disease. Fortunately, you have these Bayesian data assimilation methods, and we have done a lot of work in tracking this spatial spread of measles in pre-vaccine England and Wales. So what you see here is a compartmental model, age stratified, called as the KS KSIRAD model. And uh, a fully completed manuscript is available upon request. What you see here is we have 20 year measles incidence data from 60 cities and towns by Brian Grenfell and his uh, professor Brian Gelfell, Grenfell, Professor Otter Bianstadt and Finkerstadt. So they have the bi-weekly measles incidence data for 60 cities and towns. Now first we attempted to run a simulation with constant transmission rate. Then we tried to use seasonally varying transmission rate but no data assimilation. And finally, seasonally varying transmission rate with data assimilation. Okay. And to demonstrate how this works, I have to pay, play a quick video for you. So this is for about two years, although the simulation runs entirely for about 20 years. I'm going to show you that due to seasonally varying transmission rate, there are periods when the measles incidence completely fades out and then comes back on. Certain big cities are endemic throughout the duration of the measles epidemic. So from 1944 through 1966, there is rich data available. In fact, uh, yesterday, Professor Bjornstad may have uh, presented that 954 cities data for measles in pre-vaccine England and Wales. And I, I'd be happy to extend on this research to that high quality data. So here are two time series graphs. Again, this the top one is for 60 cities using the KSI RAD model, but without data assimilation. And this is uh, 60 cities with the KSI RAD model with data assimilation. And the blue curve is the actual observed incidence of measles in pre-vaccine England and Wales for the 20 year period. So we have had some uh, success uh, with applying Bayesian data assimilation techniques for measles, also for the ongoing Ebola outbreak in Congo. So those are the backup slides. I mean, the, the slides that Ronda, uh, Professor Ronda has shared with you is about 140 slides, but the second half of my presentation is all going to be about e uh, tracking Ebola in Congo. Data assimilation is the general class of techniques for tracking a state vector in real time and Bayesian up updates applied to a dynamic model. So what really is happening is that you have a model that you have. It could be an SIR model. It could be an SEIR model. In fact, it doesn't require or presuppose that it needs to be one of the SIR type models. It could be an agent-based model, an individual model, metapopulation model. It could be any model. Uh, data assimilation works just fine. So you project the model in time for a certain number of time steps until a new datum arrives. Once the new datum arrives, you put together the data and the current state of the epidemic, which we call as the prior together, to do a Bayesian update and feed it back to the model. Okay, And I'll show the equations that lets us achieve this. So you need two basic components for you to run a data assimilation simulation. First, you need a model, and then you need observational data, and then the active research is to how to update the parameters in real time. That is more of a difficult problem, which we are uh, still working on. But basically, if you have a dynamic model and observational data, you can put those two together to get an improved belief. The one problem, though, is the model itself may have a different dimensionality. And the observed data 
will come with a different dimensionality. For example, for Spain, I have 16,758 cells, but you're not going to get COVID-19 data for all of those grid cells. You're going to get aggregated data according to the autonomous communities. So it's going to be a big leap from one dimensionality to another. There are two steps in optimal interpolation. Optimal interpolation is uh, a data assimilation method, just like you have Kalman filtering, ensemble Kalman filter, uh, particle filter, and so on. So we have adopted the optimal interpolation method, or some textbooks call it as the statistical interpolation. First, we have a forecast step that propagates the state's distribution forward in time until the next datum arrives. And then the analysis step where an update, a Bayesian update is done to the state's distribution given the new observation. So the optimal interpolation is captured using these two equations. First, you have your observed state vector. These are all vectors here. And then F here stands for forecast. A here stands for analysis. So the prior and the posterior. This term yt minus hxt is called as the uh, innovation or it's called as the um, it's called as the observation minus forecast residual. And this k here is called as the Kalman gain matrix. And I've defined the other variables over here. So XT is the epidemic state vector. YT is the observed state vector. So if you look at the uh, Spain problem, you will have to know uh, how many state vectors for which data is available. Well, even though there are SE, IRD, five states, data may not be available for all five states. We may have only data available for IRD. So your state vector will be a stack of IRD. Oh, uh, stacked one over the other. Okay, so for example, XT would be. I'm sorry, Pesak, we just wondered if you could wrap up your uh, talk in the next minute or so, because we're just yeah, about. Yeah, I'll wrap it up in, uh, this is just about the last slide. So I'll okay. wrap it up in a minute, thank you. So it'll be stacked up like this. And the dimensionality will be 3P over one. It'll be a long vector where P is uh, 16,758. Whereas the observed data vector, yt, will just be q cross 1, where q is just the 17 autonomous communities. So the aggregated data for incidents or death coming from, uh, well, it'll be 3q over 1. Okay. And I'm happy to share uh, my full manuscript on the measles research. But then I'll conclude my presentation today with this big question. Does social distancing work? Now, the map that you see here, is from the 14th century bubonic plague or the Black Death pandemic. Okay. The darker the shade in the map, uh, the earlier disease reached there. But what you will see here is a green blob here and a green blob here. These were, some, I believe, the alpine forest. Uh, but I'm more interested in Milan. What happened in Milan? Green stands for a relatively minor break, outbreak. Everywhere in Europe, there were major outbreaks of uh, Black Death, whereas in Milan, not so much. What happened? Well, what really happened was when the news of Black Death reached Milan, the absolute despots, Viscontis, and their advisors acted quickly. They boarded up the people in their houses. They you know, they locked everybody's door and they boarded up the people. So which resulted in a very low death rate in Milan. I mean, Milan's death rate was less than 15%, which was what was common for everywhere else in Europe. Probably the lowest in Italy, save a few Alpine villages, but Milan was exceptional. Back in the day, they were able to board up people forcibly. Today, we have mayors and politicians begging or some, in some instances, using choice words to ask people to remain indoors. So with that, I conclude my presentation. If you have any questions, please email me. And I'm also opening the floor for any questions. Thank you once again to the Fields Institute for this opportunity 